According to Pew Research Center, Democrats and Republicans continue to be divided on whether offensive content online should be taken too seriously, as well as the balance between free speech and feeling safe. Friend of the show, Zed Jelani, points the data as evidence that free speech principles are increasingly becoming partisan, much more so than they were just a few short years ago. Zed joins us now for more on the free speech and censorship divide on social platforms. Great to see you, Zed. Good to see you, Zed. Good to be here. I said a few short years ago, but I think it feels like a few very, very <laughs> long years for most people who are yeah, living in this country. Yeah. Um, but just break down this data and the trends that you think are significant. Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is that if you roll back to 2017, the percentage of Democrats, Republicans, people overall, uh, they tended to hold similar views when it came to the balance between speech and uh, you know, free speech and, and like taking down offensive content or dealing with offensive stuff on the internet. Um, they weren't exactly the same, but they were pretty similar. Between 2017 and 2020, uh, and by the way, this, is all, this all comes from Pew Research Center, uh, the percentages completely changed around. So I'll give you one example. Um, in 2017, the percentage of people who said it's more important uh, or most important for people to be able to speak their minds freely online, that was 48% of Republicans said that and 45% of Democrats said that. Uh, by the time it got to 2020, the percentage of Republicans went up to 54% and the percentage of Democrats declined to 38%. Uh, there's a couple of different results like that in this Pew poll. And I think a lot of that has to do with kind of a uh, knee-jerk reaction to the election of Donald Trump. In that I think a lot of Democrats, you know, there were two or three explanations they kind of had for the election of Trump. And one of them, you know, was that basically his supporters were very effective on social media uh, and that they were basically able to get him elected through like posting memes and, and, and fake news and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think in response to that, a lot of the social media companies felt pressure from the government to start pulling down content that might be good to promote Trump promote right-wing ideas, promote offensive content, racism, sex, sexism, homophobia, so on and so forth. Um, whereas I think previously they did have some policies on those things, but they didn't enforce them as, as strictly. And I think a lot of this has to do with the idea that uh, a feeling among a lot of Democrats, I think that if they are able to kind of control the game and kind of decide what people are allowed to say, that they can kind of fix how people think. Um, right. I think conservatives feel under siege in this, but I think it is important to note that maybe it's true that conservatives are targeted more more frequently by this, but the left has been in recent days as well. So over the past week alone, I know that Jacobin had one of their videos flagged by Facebook That's community right. standards and, and stopped. And also a Palestinian advocate who actually, she was a terrorist like decades ago. She's not, no, I don't think she you know, any, is any longer a terrorist, uh, but she was prevented from uh, being on a Zoom call. Zoom actually blocked her and gave a statement as to why they blocked her. Wow. What? So I think what's happened yeah. is if social media companies have come to, you know, it used to be like a debate. Are they publishers or are they like a telephone company? Because right now no one will blame AT&T if someone makes a phone call and they say something offensive, right? Like mm -hmm. AT&T doesn't endorse that. It's just a technology. But I think increasingly these social media companies are having the burden placed on them as if they're publishers, as if they endorse every single thing that is said on their platform or said through the technology. Uh, and if your belief is, and I, I tend to have the belief that these are just like public squares, technologies people you can use to talk to, which are like telephones, then they shouldn't necessarily be held accountable for every single thing that a person says. The person themselves is, is accountable to that. Um, but if the government is going to pressure them as if they are accountable, then I think they're going to start doing things like engineering AI that will end up pulling down things like a Jacobin video. Uh, right. Because you can't, you can, you know, Facebook can't have human beings regulate 2.5 billion people or however many users they have, right? What they'll do is they'll, they'll design AIs and algorithms and things to try to pull down content that controversial or offensive, which of course is always in the eye of the beholder. Um, and then you will have things like what I just described happen. Yeah, and we covered this earlier in the show, the Jacobin thing, and it's absolutely crazy. To be clear, this is a video about Bolivia and Bernie and Black. I mean, like we talk about that stuff here every day. We very easily could have had something like that be blocked. And another thing, Zed, that we're seeing is the insertion of fact checking right, within the platform. So on Twitter, for example, you can have fact checks. Now, YouTube is actually doing the same thing. If you search like Joe Biden emails or Joe Biden fracking, there's like fact checks from USA Today says this is what the truth is. Just lay out why that's particularly pernicious. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it would be preferable to have them do fact checking rather than blocking links altogether, which is what happened with the New York Post article, which I believe no one has even found anything actually wrong in the original New York Post article about Hunter Biden, like the text right. and emails, or no one's even disputed that they're real. 
Um, but yeah, I think there's this sense. I think when Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey started those services, like Jack Dorsey used to say, I'm from the free speech wing of the free speech party. Mark Zuckerberg said, I think as, as little as a couple of years ago, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. No one wants to put us in that position. They had a more kind of free, free spirited kind of libertarian mindset. But I think what happened is after the election of Trump in particular, a lot of people were pointing to these social services as a reason that he got elected, which I don't think is very strong. There's not a very strong case to be made for that. I think bigger structural factors with the election, the economy and the state of politics is probably why he got elected. Um, but I think because they got so much pressure from the government, they started get being worried that the government would regulate them in certain ways, regulate the content of their speech if they didn't start doing all this. Um, and I think in particular, Facebook probably thinks Biden is going to win the election. So they're trying to do certain things, I think, to head off any potential regulation. The most effective of which I think would be antitrust, uh, which is that you could break up Facebook uh, into component parts. This would help the news industry because it would kind of dominate the, the flow of revenue to news right now through advertising. And also if they like decide to kick someone off their platform, they're basically killing off the, the outlet. Um, they could use antitrust to break them up. And then they could also use public utility regulation, uh, similar to how like your cable company can't discriminate against you for your point of view. You know, it could be very possible that social media companies under that regime couldn't discriminate against people for their point of view either. Uh, they would only be able to knock off like unlawful speech like child pornography or incitement to violence or something right. like that. Uh, but I think that, you know, this fact checking is a problem because it's obviously one sided. Right. Like in 2018, when Michael Avenatti came out and was a completely not mm -hmm. credible at all story about Kavanaugh, uh, it went all around mainstream media, all over social media completely wrong at the end of the day he manipulated basically julie swetnick as what we learned later on um they didn't do any of they didn't implement any of these things in response to that i really do think it's it's a it's kind of a shot aimed at the democratic party saying if we do these things if we're overbearing with censorship towards conservatives uh then we will be able to uh avoid any regulation from you in the future and unfortunately that ploy may work because right now i think it's in the left's interest and the right's interest to rein in the power of these companies but do it in a way that doesn't rely on censorship. Instead, it relies on breaking up monopolies and letting right. there be a lot more choices in terms of the companies you can use. You can go to a, you can have a certain social media platform that's biased one way, but then there should be an equally large one that you can also have access to uh, that's maybe biased the other way, or right. that has interoperability, meaning that the services can right. talk to each other, which is something you can do if you have public utility regulation, which right now there isn't. These companies have escaped that I think that's what they are trying to escape by kind of appeasing yes. maybe the Biden camp right now. That's re that's really the key point because look, if these companies aren't as large, then their individual stupid decisions don't matter nearly as much. I mean, that's really right. the bottom line here. One of the arguments that I hear made um, against what you're saying coming from a lot of liberals is basically like, look, the way we approach and think about free speech in this country is different than how other countries approach and think about free speech. I think Germany is often held up as an example, and it's worked for them to rein in some of these fringe ideas and hate speech. What is your view of that take? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think looking at it empirically, could someone actually say that like Europe isn't is is Europe or any any of the other countries, because most countries in the world do have hate speech laws. Latin America has them. Asia has them. At, most African countries have them. Uh, so it's not just Europe. But I think empirically speaking, I don't think you can say those countries are like less racist than America in any way. For instance, I don't think any European country has elected minority heads of state, except maybe I think briefly Ireland um, or at least like racial or ethnic minorities. Uh, most of them are more much more hostile to immigration than we are. And I think, look, I think our explosion of democratization of speech has been very good overall for minority rights. Uh, for instance, gay rights. We've seen a huge revolution in thinking about uh, gay people, lesbian people, transgender people over the past, I would say, 10 or 20 years. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this coincided with the uh, Internet and with the fact that you can actually meet people of that of mm -hmm. those uh, orientations and actually talk to them. And, yeah, obviously, if the Internet is a reflection of the reality of the public, you will also see offensive things, you'll see hateful things, at least relative to what you believe, because those are in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but it also gives you an opportunity just to interact with people you never had before. And I think on balance, yes, sometimes having uh, very liberal free speech in the United States means you encounter things that are just tasteful. But on balance, I think it's worked out pretty well for us. I think it, it's the reason why we've advanced when it comes to having minorities all over our society in ways that I don't think you'll find in Europe. And Europe is actually very segregated. Uh, in France, what's happening with Muslims right now with banning hijabs and public schools and things like that, you never see that in the United States, right? It would be mm -hmm. a, seen as a real violation of our 
it's only because we have the First Amendment that something like that never happened, even after 9-11 when people were so scared. Um, so I think that on balance, it works for us. I'm not saying it's perfect, and I'm not saying it means that everything always goes the way we want it to go as people who support tolerance and, and minority rights. Uh, but I think I think overall, we have a pretty good record here in the United States and also in Canada, which is, which is fairly liberal with speech as well. Yeah, yeah. very interesting, Zed. Great to see you as Thank always. Thank you, Zed. Next on Rising, unrest in Nigeria's protesters call for an end to the so-called special anti-robbery squad. Millions around the world are showing their support. Podcast host and YouTuber Angie Speaks is going to join us to discuss all of that when Rising continues.